Hi, I'm Liz, and I healed from chronic fatigue syndrome. And I've come back to share my story and the stories of others who have healed from CFS and other related chronic conditions. Nothing on this channel is medical advice nor meant to contradict what you yourself have discovered to be true. But I hope by sharing our stories, we can inspire you on your journey. I'm here with Jo Thomas. She was an NHS nurse for over 20 years and was on the front lines during the COVID pandemic. Jo is going to share her recovery journey from POTS, chronic fatigue, dysautonomia, and later nursing burnout. We will learn how she combined her Western medical training with a holistic approach to heal. Jo, I'm so honored to be interviewing you today. Oh, well, no, thank you, Liz. Thank you for doing the interview. It's a privilege. I'm very inspired by the work you do on your channel, promoting inspiration for people suffering with chronic fatigue. And it's a subject that's very passionate to my heart. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So would you mind sharing, Joe, your purpose for sharing your message today with our audience? Yeah, sure. So it's to help others, basically. Through a process of raising awareness, sharing of knowledge, and providing inspiration and hope. Because when we suffer with chronic fatigue, it can often be a lonely and isolating place. And to hear that there's other people out there that have been there, who've been through it, who understand, who get it, who believe you, and have overcome this challenge can be very inspiring and powerful. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about your life before chronic illness and how it began? So my life before chronic illness was, you know, a really good one. It was full. It was enjoyable. It was, you know, a normal life. And just before I got sick in 2017, I had just celebrated 10 years of marriage with my husband. We have two wonderful children. I was really enjoying my career working part-time as a nurse. Everything was going well. I was really happy, but admittedly life was busy and full on as it can be with modern day life. So in 2017, I became unwell with dysautonomia, which is a process in which there is dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system which regulates the involuntary nervous pathways in our bodies, things that happen without our conscious thought. So for example, regulation of our heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, our temperature control. So all these essential fundamental things that go on. For myself with this condition, the thing I noticed most was POTS. So that's postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Basically, if we just take it down to its most simplistic form, when we go from being laid down or sat to stood up, there is an excessive acceleration in the heart rate, which doesn't calm down. And when your heart rate is just beating along like you've had an aerobic workout all the time, you soon become exhausted and you experience other symptoms, which I'm sure we'll talk about at a later point. Yeah. Was there a trigger, an environmental trigger, a pathogenic trigger that triggered this? Yeah. So I'd been out walking my dog one afternoon, came home to find I had a tick adhered to my skin. I just noted it, removed it with no problem, body and head complete, and just went on with my day. The next day, however, when I woke up, I just didn't feel right. I felt really, really weak and odd. I was struggling to get ready. It felt like I was plowing through treacle. I was due to go to work. I said to my husband, I just don't feel right, but I think I'm worn out. I've been so busy of late. I'm going to go to work. And when I come home, I'm going to have supper and go to bed early. So off I went to work, got to the hospital car park. It's not too far from the hospital car park to the side entrance of the hospital. And on that short walk around, I just started to feel really odd. I felt a bit lightheaded and dizzy, but nothing too much. I thought, oh, I'm just a bit tired. And then I was aware that I felt really short, like my legs didn't belong to me anymore. And I thought, gosh, this is such a strange feeling. 
And then it felt a little bit like I was on a boat. Everything was just swaying. So I thought, right, pretty close to my department. I'll just get in, go to the changing room and sit down. And, you know, in a few minutes, this very silly feeling is just going to pass. But once I got there, the feeling of a rocking boat continued and it was getting worse. And I thought, oh, am I going to pass out? So I was sat on a chair. I took myself to the floor to sit down. And then I was starting to feel a bit better. So, you know, I'm very British. I thought, I'll get a cup of tea. A cup of tea is going to fix everything. And I went out to get this cup of tea and really didn't feel right. And a colleague came into the changing room. And she, first of all, was like, why is Joe near the floor? I mean, that's just really odd. And she said, you really don't look very well. And I said, I don't feel great. So, you know, she was a nurse. She kicked into nurse mode. She did some obs, so basic observation, like blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen levels. I mean, they were all pretty fine, except my heart rate was up slightly. And, uh, you know, I said, oh, I got bitten by this tick yesterday. I think it's too soon to be feeling symptoms if it is that. And then before I knew it, like my whole team was there and I was just feeling very self-conscious and they wanted me to go to ED, but I felt like, actually, I'm just really tired. I want to go home and I'll try and get a GP appointment today. So my husband collected me. I went home and I just slept and slept. And my husband woke me when it was time to see our GP, went to see him. And he said, oh, you really don't look very well. And I explained what had happened. And uh, he did an ECG. I think you call it an EKG in the States. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I didn't know this was going to happen because I didn't know what was wrong with me at the time. But because I was laid flat, all the symptoms I had started to improve. He did some bloods. He did a referral to a cardiologist. And to be honest, I think it was a little bit role reversal in my situation because I was like, gosh, he's been a bit dramatic because all I need to do is go home and sleep. And, uh, <laughs> and he was like, oh, no, Joe, I mean, given your age and the symptoms, it could be your thyroid. It could be an arrhythmia. It could be something with the adrenal glands throwing off bursts of adrenaline. I was like, OK, well, fine. So it went home and just didn't get better. If anything, just got worse. Other symptoms crept in. But what my lovely GP did do, he gave me something called, what's it called? A cardia. Uh, it's a little ECG monitor you put on the back of your mobile phone. You hold it with two thumbs and it does just a baseline ribbon strip ECG. So I was doing that on and off and I was starting to notice some patterns. So I was noticing if I laid flat, I felt better. If I went from touching my toes to stood up, I just had to do it twice. All the symptoms would come back. And this little ECG trace was saying I had something called AF, atrial fibrillation. It's an arrhythmia of the heart. And I thought I was really looking at this trace. And I was thinking, I don't think it really is. Because when this was all happening, I think there was a big adrenaline surge and I was literally shaking. And that was interfering with the ability for this device to read. So I then decided, Google. <laughs> I'm going to Google the reliability of this ECG device to see how reliable it is. And the results showed it was actually quite reliable. And then when I was reading the reviews, I could see that some people were using it to diagnose POTS. And I remember as a student nurse looking after a patient who had a medical history of POTS, but I couldn't really remember what it was. So I looked it up and lo and behold, it read like textbook example of what was going on. And I thought, oh, okay, this makes a bit of sense. And then fortunately I had a friend who's a nurse as well. She was married to a cardiologist. I sent through the ECG traces. And I said, I don't think it is AF. I think I might have POTS. And I thought he would think, well, it's quite typical of Joe to maybe go and jump to the conclusion. It's something a little bit more on the rarer side. And he said, oh, no, I don't think that is AF. And maybe you are right. Because I was doing a lot of looking on the internet for some answers. I came across a website called POTS UK. 
which to the audience, if you're looking for any resources, it's a fantastic one to look at. And uh, it listed some physicians that helped with diagnosing and POTS management. There was one in the trust where my friend's husband worked, and lo and behold, they shared an office. So very fortunately, he spoke to her. She said, oh, yes, I think we should try and get her referred. GP happily referred. So quite quickly in the space of three months, I had a diagnosis and appropriate management. Wow. And that's not the story for so many people, but you are a nurse, you know these people. And so when you researched yourself, it might have given you more credibility with them because they knew you, but it's often not the case that people get diagnosed within three months with these things, but wouldn't it be great if everyone was diagnosed with three months, but yeah. And I remember myself, I had a bunch of heart tests and they were like, maybe it's AFib, but we don't know. And I had never gotten the tilt table, the POTS Mm -hmm. tests, because I don't think that was as well known. No, I didn't have a tilt test. It was just basically, she checked my blood pressure Mm -hmm. and pulse, laid down, then stood and checked it at various increments to diagnose. It's very easy to diagnose. We don't need expensive tilt table tests. But what she did do was, so my GP had put me on a beta blocker initially to bring down the heart rate, but it didn't really help me because it just dropped my blood pressure. And I discovered through this process, I need a slightly higher blood pressure to be operational. All right. So now you have the appointment with the person who specializes in this. What was their approach and how did that practitioner help? So she switched me to a medication called Avabradine, which lowers the heart rate, but works in a different mechanism to a beta blocker and it maintained my blood pressure. And then from that point, probably another three months on again, plus some other changes, my symptoms started to stabilize. And she was saying to me, eat small amounts of food regularly, get some rest periods. I think that was probably about it. She had other things she was going to add in if that didn't help, but it really did. It stabilized things out. Yes. And thanks for clarifying about that, because I know the beta blockers are a common first line treatment for these things, but for some people it can lower the blood pressure and that can of course result in symptoms. I will include the name of the medication you listed for people to ask their doctor about it. And just again, This is not medical advice. This is for informational purposes only. After our chat, Joe informed me that Evaporidine is contraindicated for pregnant women or women planning to become pregnant. And please, of course, consult a trusted medical professional before taking or stopping any medication. Nothing on this channel is medical advice. But I know for myself, who already has low blood pressure, that is something to keep in mind. And you had said she had talked about eating small meals. One of the recommendations I hear is for some people, they increase salt. Is that one of them that you got? Or did you try that? Yeah. The number one was to increase your intake of salt. And she said, you know, keep it simple, have a bag of crisps every day. I mean, who loves hearing that? That's amazing advice to hear from a cardiologist, isn't it? Eat crisps. And there's other things that can help like wearing compression stockings, just to help increase that venous return from the legs up to help when you have that orthostatic intolerance. So the orthostatic intolerance is this inability to maintain yourself when you're stood. And it leads to a lot of symptoms like feeling lightheaded, dizzy, like you're going to faint, or you may experience syncope, which is fainting. So all those things make it quite difficult to lead a normal life. Yes. And I want to thank you for just so brilliantly talking about this, (laughs) explaining it so well. And my channel is, as you know, it primarily features people with ME-CFS, though many people with ME-CFS, I would say 20% do have postural orthostatic 
tachycardia syndrome, POTS, and everyone with ME-CFS also has dysautonomia. So thank you for breaking that down. POTS in itself is a cause of fatigue. So can you explain how POTS causes fatigue and maybe the difference between that and ME-CFS? My understanding is that ME-CFS is the inability to recover from exertion with the post-exertional crash that comes two hours to two days later with the neuroimmune symptoms. And POTS, which many people with ME-CFS have, it's more immediate. So can you describe that? (laughs) Sure. So you're correct that so many people with ME and chronic fatigue syndrome also experienced POTS and autonomic problems. The two are quite often uh, interchangeable and combined. So with POTS and your heart rate keeps on accelerating, you're burning a lot of energy and then you end up with an energy deficit. You do not have enough energy to maintain what you need to do. And essentially, if we break down chronic fatigue syndrome into its most simplest form, that's what we've got going on. You have not got enough energy to be able to function. So I feel sometimes for chronic fatigue, it's actually a symptom rather than a disease per se. There can be many causative factors. So POTS can lead to it. Hormonal problems can lead to it. Parasites, virus, bacteria can lead to it. And we certainly know about post-viral syndrome leading to chronic fatigue. And we're hearing a lot more about it in the media because of long COVID. So for me, that's where I sort of see it all. From having all these problems with it, it leads to a relentless fatigue. And you can get other symptoms that people with ME and chronic fatigue syndrome describe. You get brain fog, you can get aching joints, you get that paradigm of being exhausted, but not being able to sleep. Or you can sleep and you wake up unrefreshed. And all of these things can be going on if you've just got POTS or with looking at ME and chronic fatigue, the whole worlds of these problems come together and they can be experienced in a very similar fashion. Wow, that was so brilliant. I have never heard such a spot on, but also easy to understand explanation of the conditions and how chronic fatigue is a symptom of these conditions. All right, so thank you for that wonderful explanation, breaking ME-CFS and POTS down for us in dysautonomia. After our chat, Jo sent me a follow-up note regarding medical management, and she explained to me that specifically with POTS, or postural orthostatic tachycardia, that medical management is often steered in the direction of attempting to correct heart rate and improve venous return on standing. Then for both ME-CFS and POTS, there's pacing and lifestyle changes to help support and improve mitochondrial function. And again, that was regarding medical management of these conditions. So Joe, what were your key health challenges and functionality levels? The main symptoms I was experiencing was relentless, absolutely relentless fatigue, brain fog palpitations, shortness of breath, orthostatic intolerance. As things progressed, I started to get aching, burning joints. I felt weak, dizzy. I had blurred vision in my peripheral vision. And actually, if my POTS is coming back, if I'm overdoing it, that's what I'm aware of. I was having GI disturbances or reflux, finding it difficult to swallow and eat, but being hungry. Sometimes my legs would feel completely numb and they wouldn't want to work for me. At my lowest, I would say on a bad day, I struggled to get upstairs. I would do the flight of stairs and then just have to lie down and just thought, my goodness, what is going on? When is this going to end? And I would be so tired. I could cry, but I couldn't sleep. And it's that paradigm that people talk about with chronic fatigue. You're exhausted, but you can't sleep. Yes, that was three years of my life. (laughs) And I know for many, it's more. So yes. Okay. So you're on this drug 
that helps with your POT symptoms and it helps stabilize things after about three months. And you're starting to make some diet changes and also sleep. So what are some things that you did to improve your sleep? So to improve my sleep, at the point I was taking the beta blockers and I was just gradually getting worse, I went into survival mode and I was chasing my day with sugary snacks and caffeine just to get through. At the end of the day, I still had two daughters to take care of, even though I knew better not to do it. So I completely understand how people fall into these loopholes. But my sleep was starting to become affected. Once I had the Evabradine and my symptoms stabilized, I felt I had the strength to start cleaning up some of my diet with what I was doing. So the caffeine got reduced right down just to one coffee in the morning, and it was usually decaf. The sugary snacks and the sugary foods went. I mean, I wasn't eating a vast amount of highly processed foods, but I was eating some. They went. And I know some people promote different things for dealing with chronic fatigue and boosting your overall energy production. So some people may say follow a vegan diet. Some people may say follow a ketogenic diet. I didn't have a particular diet. I just went clean. I just cleaned it up. And what I was doing was just basically trying to cook with real foods. So basically the food you had there to prepare looked like it would have done coming from nature. We don't need to overcomplicate anything I feel in life. And I think particularly when you're dealing with chronic fatigue, you need things to be as simple as possible. Admittedly, to cook from raw requires a bit more time and energy. So I just cooked in batches, bulk cooked and froze a lot of food. That really helped. And I just started to pay attention to what food seemed to help my symptoms or made them worse. So I do believe we all respond very differently to different diets. And uh, there's a chap called Tim Spector. He's a professor of genetics. And he talks about the gut microbiomes and how the microbiome is different in every person. So we all respond differently to different foods. But I do think what is key is we don't want too much sugar. We don't want too many refined carbs. We don't want highly processed food. And alcohol, I was maybe sometimes having a drink, thinking, well, that helps me get to sleep. But I learned actually and started to notice through my own patterns that wasn't the case. It helps you fall asleep occasionally, but it just fragments your sleep. It's, you know, it's not a winning combination. And I think a lot of people think a drink can help you sleep. But now I know there's like biometric monitors like the Aura Ring. And someone was telling me that, yeah, the wine she thought helped her sleep, but then tells you the quality of your sleep. And it actually was not the case. So you're not getting that restorative sleep when we drink alcohol, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. And also I started to notice when I was having periods of feeling better, that alcohol, even though it wouldn't make me drunk, it made me feel much weaker. So it just wasn't a good one for me. So I'm not saying people shouldn't drink alcohol, but in my situation, I was better without it. I mean, prior to that, I just felt awful all the time. I couldn't tell what was what. And so, yeah, so I cleaned up my diet, did those things to help my sleep. I had a bedtime routine. I made sure a certain time I was getting ready. I was having time to wind down. I was, you know, putting the phone, the laptop to one side or the iPad so you're not getting that blue light stimulation. And doing things like sometimes I would have a cold shower just to bring down my body temperature. That really helped. And also with POTS, uh, for me, the orthostatic intolerance was worse on a morning. So not to be showering then was much better for me. Oh, okay. So you had a whole nightly routine and that included the cold shower that included putting your devices away. What was your device cutoff window? Did you have a certain time that you close the iPhone and put that away? So yeah, it was probably about eight o'clock. 
but I wasn't a massive one for using my devices. I mean, I am on social media now for my coaching business. I mean, that's the only reason I've come onto social media now. <laughs> I did, wasn't even on Facebook before. Wow. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> a lot of people, yeah, they don't realize how much staring at our devices at 11 o'clock is not helpful or conducive of sleep. So yes, eight o'clock. For a lot of people, that might take some discipline, but it sounds like for you, you were already not a big device person, but still, yeah, these lifestyle changes add up. So you did also say that you found some supplements helpful. And I know <laughs> everyone on the journey, we try hundreds of supplements. So which were the ones that seemed to support your health? Yeah, absolutely. So I didn't want to get down into this rabbit hole of taking a million various pills and supplements and feel like I was going to shake myself. So I kept it simple. I took a multivitamin that had a good vitamin B complex strength to it, vitamin C, vitamin D. But what really helped me in 2017 for my energy levels was coenzyme Q10. That was fabulous. And then when I hit sort of burnout from nursing in the pandemic in the winter of 21, 22, um, I tried D-ribose with magnesium and that was great as well. But admittedly, I was bringing a lot of lifestyle changes together at once. So to say which one was the best or to say if it was completely effective, I can't say. I just did all of these things. They were simple changes to incorporate and I got better. And I think I also mentally felt better because I was taking control myself. I wasn't feeling so dependent on other people or healthcare professionals. I was just taking care of myself. Oh, very powerful. Yes. And for some people, it can feel like we're lost on Google, but it sounds like you got to a somewhat stable place and now you're able to have more of a sense, is this helping me? So you could listen to your body because I know for a lot of people, we don't know what's going on, but it can show like you are a wonderful example of when we get early medical answers, we can then have more empowerment to take action versus wondering what's going on. But yeah. So I know you took a holistic approach to healing and our minds are part of our body. And how did the role of mindset impact your health recovery? Yeah. So yes, mindset. When I decided to change my mindset, it was a game changer. So when I said I wanted to change my mindset, what had been happening to a point was I had been chasing, trying to find out the specific reason I had developed these symptoms, this dysautonomia and POTS, and wondering whether basically I had Lyme's disease because I'd got bitten by a tick and got sick. I never had that red bullseye rash, but you don't always get that with Lyme's. I did have a blood test done twice on the NHS, the ELSA blood test, and it was negative, but there are some question marks over its reliability. So I was going along this journey of trying to find more sensitive tests to see if I had Lyme's, and it was taking a lot of my energy and focus. And I was saying it's taking a lot of my energy and focus. I mean, it was pretty limited to start with. And then my friends and my family and my colleagues thought this was a really good way to be going. And then just one day I just sat down and I thought about the patients I've nursed over the years and what my patients have taught me throughout my nursing career. And what they have taught me is that having a good mindset makes all the difference to your health. As in the people who felt that it was within them to make improvements, who believed that they could improve, who believed that their focus was to put in measures in place that would benefit the health, did really well. And I thought, okay, my mindset is keeping me in a slightly negative place. 
It's keeping me in a place where I feel dependent on some answers in the future for me to get better, which is fine if that's what you want to do. But in that realization, I decided I was changing my mindset to one where I was going to empower myself to put in place changes I knew that worked from looking after many patients with chronic disease over the years that just make them healthier, have a better quality of life, and they're more functional. So that was the game changer for me. Admittedly, the Evabradine gave me stability and enough strength to go to this uh, stage. So the medical management gave me stability, coaching and mindset and lifestyle changes and pacing, I haven't spoke about pacing yet and how important that is, got me to living a full life again. Mm, yes. So we'll talk about pacing, but I do want to talk more about mindset because that decision to go explore many tests. There are doctors and functional medical doctors who will run any type of test, <laughs> but the way out isn't necessarily the way back. And I tried to take antivirals long in and they didn't do anything because they only stopped replication of the virus that I already had in my body. So I needed to do another strategy. And mindset, some people can just brush it off as, oh, thinking positive isn't going to get me better. But it's not just thinking positive. It's thinking practical, like what is going to move the needle here? Because yes, maybe there's a pathogen that initially caused this. But what we need to do to heal often looks the same, regardless of the specific pathogen that got us there in the first place. Is that something you often see when it comes to healing? Yeah, absolutely. I think you said that really well, Liz, so thank you for that. But I represent two sides of the equation as such. I represent Western medicine, medical management, and coaching and an overall more holistic approach. I feel often the two need to come together but I had got to a point that when I looked at the facts and I thought, if this is limes, what can I do about it? I'm so past the period for antibiotics, really. I would have to just look at building my strength. So why don't I just get there? Because I know how to do this. I know how to do this from nursing many people over the years. I wasn't a trained coach then. If I was to go back now to Joe in 2017, I would do such a better job of getting her through this. Or I would have got a coach in 2017 that specialised in fatigue because having somebody there who is supportive, they're not judgmental. You don't need to worry about burdening them like you do friends and relatives. And they can walk that journey with you, helping with your mindset helping and setting achieving realistic goals, helping you with obstacles, helping you with any limiting beliefs, and helping you see insights that you may not necessarily see yourself, particularly when you're fatigued and your energy is low, and you probably have brain fog. Sorry, I'll do this again. <laughs> brain fog. <laughs> that was really funny, actually, because I have some friends who call it the frogs. Okay, we can keep it. And it makes you more relatable because you honestly sound so amazing and insightful. People might be like, who is this perfect person? So yeah, this is so it's amazing. my life, personally and professionally. I really feel this is what I'm supposed to be on this planet to do. I believe it that much. I honestly love it. Yes. You know, we go through these difficult times and not all of us are called to give back, but I just think it's so wonderful when people who go through challenges and then are able to turn it into their calling. And that's really wonderful, Joe, that you've answered that calling and are now helping others. I'm just going to grab some more water, otherwise I'll yes. have another brain frog incident. Oh, that's good. And yes, you know, and I encourage that, an audience to take breaks too. All right. So you mentioned pacing. Can you describe how pacing was part of your journey and what that actually looked like? 
Okay, I learned about pacing the hard way through living it in a tough experience. And when you learn your lessons the hard way, my goodness, do you learn them. So I didn't even know it was called pacing, what I was doing back in 2017. And yet again, I was looking at little clusters of things I'd learned from nursing. I picked up from various patients with chronic illness. And I knew that when people were unwell and had only so much energy reserve, they had to be really careful in how they used it. They needed to simplify their lives and prioritize what they were going to use that energy for. And what they couldn't do was get up on a morning, use up all their energy and then just rest for the afternoon. They would fall in a heap. They had to do sort of a little unit of something that used up energy. And when I say energy, it's not just physical exertion, it's mental and emotional things as well. Yeah. And sometimes the emotional stuff is more draining. So be super careful with that, guys. Factor it in. So I knew I had to do so much stop rest, so much stop rest. What happened was it probably took me about two years to feel normal 90% of the time. In that first year, there was quite a bit of improvement, but I was making that mistake of, I'd have a week or so of feeling much better. I didn't quite understand I was dealing with a chronic disease at this point. I would feel better. I thought, I'm cured. Oh, this is amazing. Back to my normal life. And this probably resonates with a lot of people. So I've learned these things. And I went back to my normal mode to crash and burn. So <laughs> yes, learning the hard way. <laughs> so I learned that actually, once I had some stability, I could attempt a gradual incremental increase in activity and keep to that small increase and see how I was going. And basically, this is what pacing is. In the early stages, I did it with a regime of charts on the wall of when I was going to eat, sleep, nap, a little bit of exercise. And actually, when I say exercise, I mean, I probably just walked the length of the garden or something. And I had a dinky garden at the time. And then the things I had to do for the children. And that's how I went about it. And then, like I said, very small increases. If I was going to do something social, that was actually for me quite draining. I had to factor in some rest time before and after. So in that, hopefully there's quite a bit of information for people who are not maybe able to get help at this point with pacing, but can just have a little look at their lifestyle patterns and what they're doing and maybe try and factor that in. And I think sometimes what's quite key is looking at your own patterns. See what you did, see what result you got. See what you did on one day, see the result you got the next day and the day after. Yes, and when we suddenly have more energy, don't cash in all your chips. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I like what you said about factoring emotional energy because that is so true and also mental energy because I so often see that having a huge impact on our health and fatigue. Yes. So, all right. So can you tell me about what your upward trajectory looked like and how you dealt with setbacks along the way? Um, I know it was like this and then the pandemic hit and then you started to get the burnout, but how did you deal with setbacks and was there anything that you did differently when you had the dip during the pandemic burnout? So pre-pandemic, when I was just the POTS person, basically, and I was having setbacks because I was crashing and burning when I thought I was better and trying to go back to my full normal self. But I learned after a while that it was a waste of time and energy. It was unnecessary negative energy to keep thinking about that failure. So I reframed it. I reframed it that my body was telling me, sorry, my body was giving me a learning opportunity to learn that that was too much and I had to take it back a notch or two. So I just really started to feel with my limited energy, I didn't have capacity for loads of negative emotions. 
and dwelling on too much the fact I didn't get this right or I should have done that. I took it as a learning opportunity to help keep progressing myself forward. That doesn't mean I didn't get times when I felt utterly fed up. I'm a human. It can be really, really hard. But yes, so that's what I did. That's so powerful. Seeing it as an opportunity and compassion. A lot of times when people hear about the mindset, people think it's just, oh, someone telling them to think positive, but how you can use mindset to have a sense of value in yourself and have a sense of compassion. So we don't feel like failures, because if you feel like a failure and your mind is telling you you're a failure, you keep pushing and pushing to try to make up for that. And you just get further and further in the hole. So being able to have self-compassion saying, you know what, I didn't do things perfectly, but I'm proud of myself and I'm right where I need to be is just so powerful. And it's part of the healing. Absolutely. And something that I advise people to do sometimes or suggest they might like to try. And it's certainly what I did with myself sometimes along with sort of mindset reframing is we're often our own worst enemy. We often have negative self-talk in our head. We are often so critical with ourselves, especially at a time when we need kindness. So if that's going on in your head, take yourself out of your body. Imagine that is your best friend going through it or your sister, somebody you love. What would you tell them? you would not be telling them that negative self-talk. Listen to the messages you would tell that other person. I used to sometimes think about it. I would take myself out of my body, dissociate myself from the experience and think if that was a patient in front of me, what would I tell them? And it was a very, very different message. Wow, so powerful. And I remember at one point in my journey, I wrote a note to myself, like my own best friend, and it was so powerful for me. And if I would have been doing that since the beginning, yeah, it would have really been helpful. So yeah, thanks for, sh for sharing that. And you're now helping others. You've answered the call and found your purpose, which is so inspiring. So what got you into considering, oh, I can help others as a fatigue coach? So, yeah, it was always been in my nature to help others. I signed up to do my nurse training at age 18. I've always been on that path. But having the experience of chronic illness myself and knowing, you know, we need a holistic whole body approach. We do need that medical management. So I'm not saying I stand outside of the medical management. I am to coexist with it. So often they're dealing with the physical symptoms that you definitely do have with chronic fatigue. They are real and they are not in your head. But sometimes we need to go upstream and look at the mind and what is going on there and do some work here. And I knew that from going through this experience myself, but also I knew it when I was a nurse. I would look at people and think the medical management is only part of the equation. The mind needs work, the person needs to be seen as a whole, and the person needs to be seen as a whole in their social situation. We do not exist like little cells and doing exactly the same things. We are unique, complex individuals that need to be understood as a whole in our environments and this is where coaching really comes in and when I hit burnout in the pandemic it was just a realization to me one I needed to get out of there for my own health yep needed to do that also I had a family to think about and I needed to be functional for them but also it just it gave me a beautiful push to be brave, to hand in my notice, and to start a coaching career. So I often think a lot of things that have happened to me have happened for a reason. Now, I don't want the audience to think, how dare she say this? I was never meant to have ME or chronic fatigue syndrome. Absolutely, you weren't. But for me, there has been positive aspects of it. It's led me to this point in coaching, and this is where I'm supposed to be. All my nursing knowledge and background to this point 
helped me when I had my problems and is helping me as a coach to help others. I still do nurse. I do nurse one day a week. I'm a clinical nurse specialist. And I'm just so fortunate that I can bring both these worlds together a little bit more. That doesn't mean there isn't room for other professionals, other healers, other functional medicine people to come into the equation. But I just, I hope as a person, as a coach to help, I'm just balancing it up a little bit more. Wow. So Joe, what is your final message to people watching this? So slow down, breathe, be kind to yourself, um, pace yourself, clean up your diet, consider some supplementation, um, and uh, work on your mindset. Think about getting some help. Think about a coach maybe who can help you with your mindset, setting realistic, achievable goals, helping you with your limiting beliefs and helping you with obstacles. And if need be, help you with some reframing. Um, I, just, I just wish everybody out there well and good luck with everything and have lots of energy. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much, Joe. This was just such an informative and empowering story. And thank you for sharing your story with us today. I am so honored to get your message out there. No problem. And thank you for your time, Liz. And thank you for everything you do, providing hope and inspiration for those out there with ME and chronic fatigue. Thank you. Have a lovely evening and just thank you so much. This was brilliant. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Take care, Liz. Bye, Bye then. Bye-bye.